Good afternoon, everyone. Just going to let a few uh, give time for a few folks to get in and join us today. As you know, today is the last Friday in August, so the kids are headed to school and we're back at sort of normal work. And it's also since it's the last Friday of the month, that means our webinar today will be led by our team at the Center for Sustainable Healthcare Quality and Equity. Um, uh, Chini Okachukwe, who? Sorry, we'll be leading today's webinar. Um, just a quick uh, to help things move along. Uh, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask of the panelists, please enter them in the Q and A box, um, and that way Cheney can go and uh, go ahead and sort of lead and that can assist her in moderating the conversation and getting those questions asked. Also, if you just want to participate and just to put some notes and thoughts and comments on the side, please use our chat box on the side, and that way you can hear from her. Um, we also have a program coming up in Flint, so if you're interested in that, please reach out to us at NMQF. But without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Cheney, who will lead today's conversation. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you all hear me? All right, great. Thank you so much for coming. Hi again, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We hope you're having a wonderful uh, summer so far. We are that you're here with us. We're excited to have you as we are going to be talking about something that's really exciting, something that's really important, especially as we go into the flu season. With me today, um, uh, before I go into that, I just wanted to quickly introduce myself. My name is Chinu. Uh, sustainable health care equity and quality team. Um, we call that SHC. I'm joined today by esteemed panelists, very knowledgeable, big um, subject matter experts from the vaccine space. And I'd like to first introduce Mr. Char Dr. Charlie John, I'm sorry, who's a senior director of healthcare policy and strategy of, at Walgreens. Uh, also joining us today is Phyllis Arthur, she is the Senior Vice President, Infectious Disease and Emerging Sciences Policy, Emergency Sci Emerging Science Policy of Biotechnology Innovation Organization. Also with us today is Abby, Abby Bowens, who is the who is a coalition manager at Adult Vaccine Coalition. So I'll let them speak a little bit of what, uh, tell us a little bit more of what they do. But in, in um, summary, these are subject matter experts who are here to help us understand what adult vaccine, the adult vaccine space, who get, who gets what and what's paid for so far. Um, over to you, Phyllis. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Jenny, for putting together this webinar. Really important topic. And actually, as you said in your opening, an exciting one, because there have actually been some great positive developments in terms of coverage of adult vaccines in particular. And so the three of us are going to work together to talk with all of you about how coverage has changed for the better for adult vaccines and why that's so important for public health and the health of every single American adult who's at risk for all these different infectious diseases where we have innovations. So um, welcome to the webinar. And why don't we go to the next slide? So I think one of the things that we want to start with is actually why this is important. And really, this is important because three out of four adults are actually missing one or more of the four, now five, critical vaccines that they need, right? So flu, pneumonia, shingles, which hopefully everybody knows about, and the tetanus, diphtheria, and acetylene pertussis vaccines. In addition, this season now, they will also be able to get respiratory syncytial virus or RSV vaccine. So you have vaccines for respiratory illnesses and other kinds of illnesses that particularly affect adults, elderly adults, and also adults with underlying conditions. And then all of us who are over 20 years of, of age have, uh, have a reason to get vaccinated, but we're not getting everyone vaccinated like we should. And these vaccines are available. How can we make it easy for people to get the ones they need? Next slide. So our goal is to talk with you about how coverage, where coverage sits in the both private and public insurance programs. And so I'll start off with the private sector insurance coverage. We actually had really good gains with this particular coverage area already with the passage of the Affordable Care Act or ACA in March of 2010. That very comprehensive healthcare reform had a, a, a myriad of different changes in order to try to get more people covered for help with health insurance. And some of those actually were positively impacting vaccines. So two different things there. One, making 
it easier for individuals to get their recommended vaccines, CDC recommended vaccines, without any cost outlay for the patient, what we call no out-of-pocket cost or $0 cost sharing. You'll hear both of these said um, when you read about this issue. In addition, the Affordable Care Act or ACA expanded the Medicaid program and, and created the Medicaid expansion program that allowed more adults to potentially leverage state Medicaid programs, depending on whether that state decided to expand Medicaid. And hopefully some of you live in states where they did expand Medicaid, which has offered much more insurance coverage to many more people. Both of these changes were done where vaccines were included and required by private insurance and expanded Medicaid state programs to cover vaccines with zero out-of-pocket cost for the individual getting vaccinated. And that has certainly allowed people to feel that that barrier, financial barrier has been lowered. The second, next slide, is actually around some really great benefits that have been added in the Inflation Reduction Act, which just passed last year, in the Medicare and the Medicaid space. And so I'll kick off here and then my colleague Abby Bonus will take over and, and describe a little bit more what's happened in Medicaid. I'm gonna tackle what's happened in Medicare. So in the Inflation Reduction Act, one of the things they did was they reduced the out-of-pocket costs for the individual for vaccines that are covered in your Part D as a dog plan. That's the plan that's executed at the pharmacy level where you can go and get your shingles vaccine, you get your flu vaccine there. Um, so this, this change happened just recently. In addition, the Inflation Reduction Act or IRA actually added requirements for coverage of all CDC recommended vaccines in the traditional existing Medicaid population that all states have. Let's go to the next slide and I'll drill down a little bit on how Medicare covers vaccines for adults. Historically, Medicare Part B already had zero cost sharing or no out-of-pocket costs, but for a limited set of vaccines. So if you're a Medicare patient, you could go to your doctor or your pharmacy and get flu, pneumonia, hepatitis B, and during the COVID pandemic, they added COVID-19 vaccines with no outlay by the patient. That was already there from the inception of the Medicare, for, from a big change to the Medicare program in the 90s. Starting in January of this year, those same guidelines and regulations fell to those vaccines covered in the Part D program or DOG. And so now the full complement of vaccines that a person, a Medicare beneficiary would get are available to them between the doctor's office and the pharmacy with zero outlay of out-of-pocket costs. So this is really important because if you look at the slide, patients were paying a lot of money in those co-pays they were paying at the pharmacy counter, and now they will not have to pay those co-pays anymore. So let me transition it to Abby Bonus, who can talk about the changes made in Medicaid. Hi, everybody. So glad to be here today with you all. We can go to the next slide and talk a little bit about the Medicaid changes. So similar to Medicare, um, the changes that will happen in Medicaid will make it easy for people to get vaccines at no cost. So this provision will actually begin in October of this year. So in just a couple months time, and the timing is really perfect, given that it will be going into a really important um, respiratory or, or winter season to go get vaccinated. So what it does is that um, some states currently do offer no vaccine charges um, and have that full coverage across their recommendations, but not all states do. So what this provision really does is it says, no matter what state you're in, in the US, you will get coverage at no cost. So it's the, the three parts here. One is that coverage is there. Second, that there's no cost sharing for the individual. And then in some states that had already been offering vaccine, there's a little bonus for them um, to help implement and just to say, you know, have a few extra dollars for providers to be doing this work. Uh, CMS just released the guidance on what this is going to look like and how states can get ready for it at the end of June. And I think what's really important are a few of the things that are highlighted in, in this gray box down the bottom here is that they have basically said they must follow all recommended vaccines. So it's not one vaccine or another, but whatever the CDC says is important for people to go out and get. Um, it really includes a broad variety of providers in the immunization neighborhood, which is wonderful. This way people will have some flexibility on where they can get the vaccines. And then it encourages 
some additional payment there for our providers that are offering the vaccines. That's an area that we can talk a little bit more on later, but something we're very interested in supporting that providers. So the next step here is that states are hopefully hard at work getting ready for this. And by October 1st, they'll need to submit to Medicaid their plan to put this into action. And some states have already started doing that. Um, all of that data is available on the Medicaid website, but it's really a state-by-state -state process. They'll be putting in individual plan amendments to make this happen. And this is just really important because Medicaid covers one in five adults in the US. And you know, this is about 70 million people. So we're really excited about this for a good reason. This will really help expand access and hopefully improve utilization of these important vaccines. And as Phyllis mentioned, the list of vaccines is growing. And so all the more reason to try to have these available now so that people can have access. The other important reason is that over the last few years, a lot of people may have gone out and gotten a COVID-19 vaccine, but they missed other recommended vaccines. So it's a really great time to be talking to the population in Medicaid as well as Medicare as well on to go back and catch up on any vaccines that were missed. So the timing of this coming online couldn't be more important and we're very excited about it. If you go to the next slide, I'm just gonna show a little map so that we get an idea of where I'm talking about. And our friends at Avalier Health had put this great report out a couple months ago where they really did an analysis of what the states currently look like. And this way you can get a sense of like who was already covering vaccines versus where we wanna be paying a little bit extra attention as this comes online. And so this gives you an idea, the green ones are um, states that have, you know, all the recommended vaccines. Some of these states do still have some cost involved. And then there's other states where we're gonna be really looking at kind of where coverage will be, um, we'll be making some changes. So just to note that, um, and we can move forward now um, to the next slide. And I'm actually, actually to... oh, go ahead, Phyllis. No, I, let me actually add, I think, you know, the list of vaccines that are covered is extremely important. So we're still working obviously to make sure that Every, that the that when the regulations go into effect, every kind of vaccine an individual needs is covered. So the things you need for um, your overall health, the things you might need because of the job you have. So if you're working in veterinary medicine, you might need a vaccine that everybody else doesn't need. The things you need if you're traveling for business, you're traveling. So the, we're trying to make sure that these the coverage we have here covers all the vaccine an individual, individual may need to make sure they remain completely healthy. And part of that process is making sure that when these, these programs are implemented, they are as broad as possible in that coverage. And I think, you know, I think Abby did a great job talking about the benefits here, but I think the other thing is to make sure that it's everything an individual needs because of what the way they're living their life. Um, so, so, and Charlie, maybe you want to say something too about how pharmacists play a role in both in Medicare and Medicaid. It's so important. Yeah, thank you for that, Phyllis. And, and I will, um, you know, Cheney had asked me to discuss the, this upcoming program for the uninsured, but if I just can take a quick step back. And, and first, I, I do want to prop up my colleagues, Phyllis and Abby here. Um, they are champions in this space, and it was their tireless work um, along with other stakeholders that, that made these policy changes happen. So, um, you know, the, the country is in, in gratitude to efforts like that so that all can, can really access these vaccines. You know, it, it is so important that these changes happen um, because as a former pharmacist, it's, it's been several years since I practiced, but I've seen this firsthand. I've seen it on the front lines that when a patient comes in to the pharmacy and maybe they're even unaware of the um, of the vaccine, just don't don't know why they should get it, if it's important, things like that. So we spend um, a lot of time counseling them and educating them and helping them feel comfortable and confident that this is the step that they should take. And then all of a sudden, we go ahead and process that vaccine claim, and they're presented with a copay of fifty dollars or seventy dollars or hundred dollars, and they turn around and walk away. And guess what? They're not coming back in. And our own research even showed that when a copay on a vaccine uh, exceeded $15, that patients were twice as likely to abandon that vaccine than if it was lower than that. And when the copay reached levels like $70 and $100, which many of the Part D vaccines did, that abandonment rate changed to six times as higher. Um, so this, this out-of-pocket cost is, in fact, a huge barrier. And by eliminating this, 
Um, I think we, we have patients feeling much better about seeking vaccines and um, you know, seeking those sites that, that provide the vaccines and feeling confident that that cost won't be a barrier to that. So um, it's just thrilling to know that we've come this far with this policy. So I will, um, I will transition real quick then. So Phyllis and Abby talked a lot about what coverage looks like in the insured space. Um, why I wanna talk about this area, and this is hugely important and, and timely. Um, I think everyone's aware we're, we're seeing the cases and hospitalizations for COVID significantly spike. Um, the most recent week, we're up 22% in hospitalizations week over week. Uh, in some parts of the country, that number is in the 60s and 70s. So, you know, we could be heading for crisis. So it's time for, for all of us to, to, to get back on track and all hands on deck and ensuring that we're, we're protecting everyone from COVID. Um, the good news is that there's more help on the way. Uh, within a matter of weeks, we should have an updated vaccine for COVID um, that will uh, address the more prevailing variants um, so we can all feel confident about being protected this fall season. Um, I do want to go back to sort of when the, the pandemic started and, and how the, the nation's response began. We knew all along that vaccines and the other tools were going to be our ticket out of this. And it was an incredible feat uh, that in about a year's time, we were able to develop a vaccine that was safe and effective uh, and that was available for, for the patients. The second big step on that was getting people to get it, right? Turning vaccines into vaccinations. Um, and this was a broader effort around distribution and administration. And, and I, in fact, had the privilege of working alongside the, the team over at Health and Human Services on this aspect as our pharmacies, along with many of my other pharmacy colleagues, were, were primary sites for providing the vaccine. You know, of course, from an epidemiological standpoint, we needed as many people as possible to get the vaccine, but we needed policy action to complement that so that that process was seamless. And one of the main policy visions was to make sure that the vaccine was as widely available and accessible as possible. And it's why you saw so many people, so many providers partner with federal government and state government and serve as access points. Um, I'm actually incredibly proud of the role that pharmacy played to, um, in, in the pandemic response. To date, pharmacy has provided over 50 million COVID tests and over 300 million vaccinations. Uh, and in fact, three out of uh, every four vaccines that occur today are occurring in the pharmacy. And I just saw a recent study too that said that that contribution for pharmacists, and these are using conservative estimates, but that it averted 1 million deaths, 8 million hospitalizations, and averted over $450 billion in healthcare spending. So um, just want to, to congratulate my, my pharmacy colleagues on, on everything that was done there. Now, making the vaccines as available and accessible as possible meant having a pathway for the uninsured to access the vaccine. You know, estimates put this population at around 30 million individuals. Um, so there is no way that we were going to achieve our targets if we did not make it accessible to them. Um, and it's and why that's a, why it manifests is that if you look at even all the other vaccines, when you look at the vaccination rates between those who are insured and those who are uninsured, it is a precipitous drop. For example, the vaccination rates for flu, it's about 50% for the insured. That number hovers around 10% for the uninsured. If we look at pneumonia uh, or, or, or shingles that Phyllis talked about earlier, shingles for the insured is, is just over 30%. That number is below 10% for, uh, for the uninsured. And so much of that is obvious, right? If you have a high cost for something, then you're likely not going to get it, right? But I think another main aspect is that if you're uninsured, you're not even going to really seek out the service. You're not going to walk into a physician's office. You're not going to visit a pharmacy because you may think that there's nothing there for me there. Um, but them walking in is our opportunity to first educate them about the vaccine and then provide them options um, that they may not have known that they had, but they have to come in first. And I think giving people certainty that their vaccines are going to be covered is what's gonna allow that to happen. And, uh, and creating this pathway um, got them through the door. Now, where we are today, the public health emergency has ended. I'm sure everyone's aware of that, but the emergency circumstances still do exist. I just alluded to the, the hospitalizations and case numbers earlier. And so knowing that we need to continue to have this widespread access to the vaccine, 
as we have new variants and new protection is needed, uh, HHS, along with partners, created the Bridge Access Program. Uh, this program is a partnership between the U.S. government, the provider side that will enable administration to take place, and then the vaccine manufacturers um, that will subsidize the vaccine cost. And how we'll operate is, is basically two, two realms. Um, and we can maybe move to the next slide. You have the sort of public health infrastructure side, and then you'll have the, the private side. So in the public health infrastructure side, this is the federal government and the state governments working together to at local health departments, other local health providers, um, federally qualified health centers, rural health clinics, other safety net clinics. The vaccine will be provided to those sites so that they can go out and be in community. And then the second half of this will involve the pharmacies. The government is partnering with the pharmacy so that they can enable administration and really enhance the reach of, of the pharmacy access. You know, just over 90% of the population live within five miles of a pharmacy. So you're really covering um, the, virtually the entire country uh, by having pharmacies serve as access points. So the, the final details of these programs are still being worked out and they will come out shortly. Uh, but the expectation is that the program um, we'll be up and running when we see vaccine launch in a few weeks. So we're, we're all getting very excited about that. I think we you know, all need to collectively continue to build awareness and build that enthusiasm and excitement for this new vaccine. Uh, and and you know, as clinicians and trusted messengers, um, we need to get that information out. And then we need to make sure that everyone has the information that they need, that they can access it, where to get it, will it cost me things? So we'll be doing that everyone on this uh, in this webinar today should be sharing that information. So I'm um, very excited about this program rolling out. Let me let me add, Charlie, that was actually masterful. Thank you so much for the way you talked about the bridge program. I learned about a lot about it in that few minutes. Um, I want to remind folks that in addition to the uninsured and the COVID-19 vaccines being covered in part B as in boy, one of the good things, one of the things that's important to note is it is very, uh, now there's a very good process and seamless process. So when the COVID updated vaccines are approved by the FDA over the next couple of weeks, and then recommended by the CDC shortly thereafter, for private insurance, Medicare and Medicaid, those insurance programs, the process should be relatively swift for the coverage for those new vaccines to kick in if they weren't covered beforehand. So the hope is with the bridge program plus the general process we use for covering new vaccines that whether you have private insurance or you're Medicaid covered or you're in the Medicare program or you're uninsured, you can walk into the vaccinator of choice for you uh, or you as vaccinators on this call can see your patients across all their different insurance or non-insurance programs and be able to offer them the updated vaccine with ease and facility. So know that the, the process for coverage in the other programs is relatively straightforward. People know how to do it and they're, and people are waiting for it. And those two triggers, the FDA approval and the CDC recommendation are the trigger for that coverage across all the insurance programs. And then this trigger for the start of the bridge program. So Abby, I think you're gonna talk about the longer term solution for the uninsured because we will certainly want them to get the COVID vaccine, but we also know we want that population to really be able to leverage all the vaccines they need to. So let's go to the next slide. And I think this just builds off this conversation of like, how do we make sure that everyone gets all the vaccines that they need? And we've heard some really great updates on the Medicare and Medicaid side. And we actually believe that adding in between the private marketplace and those two new changes that almost 90% of our country can go out and get those vaccines for free. And that's huge and so exciting. And now we also wanna turn our attention to that final mile and think about how are people that don't have insurance being able to access not just one vaccine, but all of those recommended vaccines so that we can have everyone have that chance to be healthy and, and avoid these vaccine preventable diseases. So I just wanted to note an exciting proposal um, that was in last year's budget and the budget before that would actually think about what it looks like to vaccinate adults with all recommended vaccines. And so it really would build off of what we have currently in our childhood system, which is the vaccines for children program. 
as well as work in tandem with the current infrastructure that's set up, which is the, um, it's often nicknamed the 317 program, but it's basically immunization infrastructure across our country. How do we get those vaccines, as Charlie talked about, out to the states and local um, providers so that they can be vaccinating? But that also has a lot of um, infrastructure around the technology of what it takes to vaccinate, the um, the safety and the efficacy and the, the monitoring and all those pieces that all kind of falls under that 317 or infrastructure um, funding. And so this program would really build off of those two pieces. And what it would seek to do is purchase those vaccines, make sure that states, local governments and other partners that will be involved have access to them to then hand out. It would incorporate, you know, what it takes to to administer and have those kind of provider fees available so that we can be supporting our providers in offering vaccines. And then those operations and safety and distribution mechanisms. So this is something that um, the Adult Vaccine Access Coalition, our coalition is very interested in supporting. And we're thinking about how we can work with members of Congress, um, as well as the administration on how to support this coming forward. So more to follow on this, but we're always looking for additional advocates. So if you're interested in a, a new endeavor, um, we would love to welcome you all um, to work with us moving forward. So um, for now, I wanted to just move us forward to the next slide where we can talk about a little bit about what it actually takes to be successful in getting these vaccines out. And I think it's really the combination of the provider side, as well as the partners, um, folks that are working locally on the ground. And so this really was a wonderful example of how we got so many vaccines out during the course of the last few years around COVID is we really leaned heavily on the whole immunization neighborhood and all those providers working together with public health. Um, similar to as Charlie described in what will happen with the bridge program, that's really what we saw happen during the COVID pandemic. Um, and then I would also just say, you know, really working with folks on the ground, another success that we saw during the pandemic were community health workers and the leaders within the community helping to get information out and make strong recommendations and really point people towards those providers as well, because we know that message from a provider to an individual is the most trusted source of information. And so all of these pieces really go together. And again, just a really important opportunity now to think about doses that we missed over the last couple of years because people weren't out there getting those recommended vaccines. So now is the time that we can really all get together um, and think about how we can use those messages and share information to get people out and receiving all these vaccines, especially if they're going to be free. So um, all the more reason to go out and get them. So Charlie or Phyllis, I would love to just pause here and see if you have anything else to add to this section and really talk about what it takes to have all of us working together on this front. Yeah, I think uh, I'm so glad you you raised this because um, I, I think this is key to sort of achieving the goals. You, you know, I know we had the stats about uh, how what percentage of the population. Oh no, it's here. Sorry, <laughs> the percentage of the population that has received their first dose. That number is above eighty percent now. By the way, um, the it it amounts to sort of that those last few who we, we need to make sure we, did, we don't forget, but that do not drop through the cracks. Um, and I think, you know, we, we did some polling um, and there's also been some polling out there as well that uh, at, the, at the outset of the pandemic, the, the vaccine hesitancy rate, it was about a third of the population were uncertain about getting, getting the uh, vaccine. And we saw that number in the 50s and 40s in certain minority communities too. Um, and we were able to do research where, you know, we didn't turn it totally around, but we saw such significant jumps in that. And I think it's because, you know, not only Walgreens, but collectively, we, we didn't just make the assumption that, okay, we have the vaccine here. Now let's just go and get it. Everyone's going to come in and get it. When we go out, everyone's just going to get it. No, we wanted, to make, we wanted to make sure that people were comfortable and knowledgeable and confident that this is the right step for them. And so a lot of times that is, you know, your local pharmacist or your local physician or, or nurses at the clinics that, that are able to have those conversations and um, they're the trusted resource for, for the patients. But it's other times where there are different messengers that these are where the community goes to. Um, and we saw it important that we need to partner with those members of the community so that collectively we bring, we bring the message and we, we convince people that this is the right step for them and the right step for the country. Um, so yeah, everything that you're saying, Abby, is so important. I wanted to 
I threw this picture on the slide. This is one of the, the proudest things I, I was able to be a part of um, for Walgreens specifically, but we, we definitely partnered with the government to, to make sure it ran out smooth. But you'll spot the, uh, the bus um, over there in the top corner. Yep, that is a, that is a coach bus. Uh, it is draped in Walgreens and this is your shot. It, this thing was traveling down the highways across the country, going down I-95, cross I-10, I-18. Can you imagine this big bus just driving by and everyone's kind of riding by and looking and seeing what's going on in there? Um, so it was just neat to, to bring some awareness as we were doing that. But what we did here is we visited over 30 communities across the country over a period of three or four months. And we drove up right into the neighborhood. I mean, this street, that street parked right across the house. And people came out and we worked with the community to make sure that they, they were aware of the event. This is what we're gonna be talking about. Um, don't just come and get it if that's what, if you, if you don't want to, but come and talk to us about it. And if at the end of that, you wanna get it, then that's great. But even still, we were able to just go knock on a house uh, and, and just say, hey, we're here um, providing vaccine information and vaccines if you wanna get it. Yeah, we're right there, right across the street in that big bus. Um, and so. People were just like, yeah, I'll walk out there. And then what was neat is they left and they started rounding up the, the neighborhood and it was, it was really neat. So uh, you saw a true, true partnership and then just the value of, of insurance or a value of making sure we're communicating to patients, um, helping them feel comfortable about what they're doing. Uh, and then look, they will be great champions for us as well. Uh, so really important aspect that we all partner. I think there were so many great examples of that during the pandemic, Charlie, churches that did flu and COVID together, um, you know, and, 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 and offered health screenings of other kinds. So coupling it with all the healthcare things that people need, lipid screening, blood pressure measurement, education on diabetes, at the same time as you're talking about the importance of vaccination, particularly I think in adult healthcare, that marriage of those discussions of managing your underlying conditions for your best health, while also thinking of immunizations as part of that process of managing your best health is what I think a lot of these community programs do exceptionally well. And so how can we continue to have those kind of partnerships to fix the, the box at the bottom of the screen, which is we had so many routine immunizations missed for kids, for adolescents, and for adults that some of these kind of programs this fall could actually help people catch up um, and, and get to, to back to square one where we want them to be fully immunized, educated by people that they trust in a location that's easy to get to. There's some good practical logistical questions in the chat about doing that. So maybe we turn before it back. Before we go to into that, before we go into that, Phyllis, thank you so much to both yeah, three yeah, of you yeah. for the amazing, amazing discussion. And just speaking of partnerships, I would be amazed if I didn't speak about three of our phenomenal programs at SHC. We have the Hair Wellness Warriors, where we use trusted voices of barbers and hairstylists across the country. And they have been very resourceful to us in um, promoting health, promoting vaccine um, education and vaccine accessibility to folks around, to their clients and communities. We also have the Faith Health Alliance um, group, the Faith Health Alliance program, which uses the trusted voices of pastors, black pastors across the nation. And they have been phenomenal. Started off in Baltimore, increased flu vaccine rates before the pandemic up by over 13%. And now we've grown to over 25 churches and we're so proud of them. There's also the Community Pharmacist Ambassador Program where we partner with community pharmacies such as Charlie Jones, Walgreens Pharmacies and many more across the nation. And then we you work with them to let folks know, just as Charlie said, even if you're not ready to take the vaccine, come and talk to us about the vaccines. Come and find out what the vaccines are about. Come and answer, come let's answer questions about the vaccines that you may have. And some most times they get out of those conversations more willing to take the vaccines. And so we're so grateful for our partnerships, partnerships that exist in our community, such as these. Thank you again, Charlie, for your insight as a pharmacist. Thank you so much, Phyllis, for your insight as a policymaker. We're so grateful to you. Of course, to you, Abby, an adult vaccine access coalition member who's making sure that the vaccines are not just available, but that folks have access to them. Thank you so much. And now we're going to jump into those questions. I see that some of them have already been answered. And I want to say thank you so much, Charlie, jumping on them. Um, 
going to the ones that have not been answered. The first one says, how do these provision, how do these provisions ensure the providers have or stock recommended vaccines? So all of these things that we talked about, both for Medicare and Medicaid for the bridge program, how does that help with stocking up recommended vaccines for providers? So I think that's a great question because these provisions really are about reducing the patient's cost and making sure that, the, that like Charlie's example doesn't happen. After all that great education happens, you find out that it's too much money for the patient to afford. I will say all of us are also working on policies that help make sure that providers of all kinds, doctors, pharmacies, community health centers are actually reimbursed at a rate that covers the cost of being an immunizer. Right. So, you know, you've got to manage the fridge and you've got to make sure your temperature checking, you have that time when you're counseling, all those things that a provider needs to do around that immunization interaction with the patient need to be covered by a significant or a, 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 the correct amount of reimbursement for the provider's time, as well as a correct, a correct, correct amount of reimbursement for the acquisition costs of the product. So the providers have to do two things. Right. So some of these programs the product comes free from the federal government. In other insurance programs, the provider buys the product outright and submits for reimbursement to insurance for both the vaccine, their time, and the cost of being an immunizer. And so our goal as a policy community of which the three of us are very involved is raising, making sure that that number is such that providers view it as at least break even <laughs> to actually stock vaccines in their refrigerator. But we also have what we call the national adult immunization standard immunization standards. And that is a provider could say to a patient, have that really great conversation. This is why it's important. I immunize myself and my family. This is why you should do it. And then refer that patient to a pharmacy for, for vaccination. So Abby kept referring to the immunization neighborhood. And that's really what this is, right? So if, if I talk to the patient about it one place and they go get vaccinated in another place, that's a win, right? So, so I think our goal is to make sure all the providers are paid equitably for the work they're doing and the mm -hmm. patient doesn't see any cost to that mm -hmm. is what we are all working to achieve. That's our North Star for sure. Thank you, Thank you so much. To that during the last couple of years during the public health emergency, the rates did go up because I think there was a real acknowledgement of what it took to handle and to offer and the counseling that was involved in all those pieces. And so we saw that jump and that's that's a place we would love to be and see more of for all vaccines because I think it's just as important at every encounter to have that conversation. And so just to know um, um, in agreement that we we're definitely working on that, but we also thought primarily it was essential to take away the cost for the for that individual first. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks to both of you. I hope that was helpful, Jacob. Okay, so now Melanie asks, she says, it's not easy to tell in my EHR whether my patients have Medicare Part D. How should this change my conversation with them about when or where to get their vaccines? My, my office versus pharmacy. Example, one dear patient had to pay $300 for the shingles vaccine when given in my office. Thank you. And so that is the big change, right, in terms of, you know, what that cost is. That was, you know, it's a two-dose vaccine. People were having to pay for it. It is also a bit of a billing challenge in terms of um, something else for our work list, um, making it easier for the providers to be doing that billing directly, no matter what type of um, Medicare it is. It's a lot easier right now as it stands for doctors to be billing in the B space and pharmacists to be billing in the D space. Although Charlie can respond, pharmacists have figured out how to use the B space just as much as the D space. And now what we wanna do is try to help make that happen more in the physician's office as well. Ideally, a person should be able to get whatever vaccine is needed from whatever provider is available to them. And so that is the end goal here is to try to make it really easy. It could yeah, be the, I think the- Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Right, so I was gonna say an overall point, right, is let's make it simple for the patient. Um, and that is ultimately where we wanna go with, with policy. We have a great step forward here that we're eliminating cost sharing. Um, but you know, the average person, they're not going to say like, okay, this one's in B, this one's in D, this one has cost sharing. I, this one, I gotta go to this office, this one, I, that's too much to, to, to navigate. And it's just, again, it's another way to create a barrier. Um, and so as we do move policy forward and, and Melanie to your 
ultimate um, you know, hope here is that we'll have a, a much more cohesive, streamlined process where patients don't have to really make those decisions and, and thoughts. They can just go wherever and it'll be covered. I think in the interim, because uh, again, that's our North Star, right? In, in the interim, I would say, since the system doesn't tell you, it's probably good to ask the patient, instead of saying B and D, which is so technical, say, do you have part of Medicare that covers your drugs? And that, in essence, that's what that is, right? So, so unfortunately, because of the way the legislation was done in the 90s, instead of putting all the vaccines in, in essence, the medical home benefit, like it is for private insurance, some subset of vaccines went here and some went there, right? So if a patient, a patient should know whether they have that part of Medicare that covers their drug costs at the pharmacy. If they have that, you can send them to a pharmacist and know that now that shingles vaccine would cost them zero. <laughs> um, and so I, I think we would like, obviously, the doctor to be able to give that vaccine right there on the spot but the reimbursement is too tricky, but at least that referral can take place with the confidence that the patient that's got either Medicare C, like a Medicare Advantage plan, which covers drugs, or D, which covers drugs, they will get that benefit of the, the zero out of pocket. And probably it's about asking them if they have the drug plan within Medicare and, and seeing what they say, because it's probably true the EHR is not gonna give you the information you're looking for. Yeah. Melanie, I hope that was helpful. All right, thank you so much. Moving on, Heather says a challenge we are navigating, navigating is how we continue mobile vaccination services with the requirement that mobile providers screen for insurance and bill accordingly. Many do not have this infrastructure in place and it may hinder our overall capacity to address vaccine access gaps. Any of you can speak to this, please. So this is something we were, we were actually all working on as a community before the pandemic <laughs> because these mobile vans, are a great way to get into the community and vaccinate. Um, so some, the CDC had worked with many state health departments to try to actually get different kinds of organizations recognized as being able to bill insurance. And again, this is the complexity of the American healthcare system that, that literally you need to be recognized as a provider in that insurance program, including Medicaid, in order to bill said system. So quite a number of states were actually working many times in their immunization coalition or in their state health department to get those mobile vans and those kinds of those kinds of vaccination clinic types recognized by insurance in that state and the Medicaid program in the state as immunizers so they could easily bill, right? They could see the patient's insurance card. They could say, oh, you're Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona. I know how to build them, they recognize me, I build them, they pay me back, right? So, so a lot of times I think it's about, we need to re-kickstart those programs because it was going very well. And the CDC was helping with that a lot. They were trying to build that infrastructure so that more kinds of immunizers, including those mobile clinics, could be recognized to do this work. So I think probably it's also about talking to the health department to see if they have done that work and potentially your mobile van could be, your, your organization that's doing that could be recognized by the insurers in the state or Medicaid in the state as an immunizer and you would find it easier to bill for the vaccine you're getting. Thank you. Abby, do you have something to add? No, just really in favor of expanding mobile vaccination and that <laughs> is a great thing. The drive-through clinics as well, like we're really excited about the things that can be done now and that we've seen grown over the last few years. So um, sorry that I don't have any thoughtful advice there, but I, I love that you are trying to do it and we want to see more of that happening. And, and I yeah. would say sometimes, and Chinny, you know, because you facilitated a lot of these partnerships, but um, there can be, you can partner alongside with pharmacies that may be able to come out and, and, and have the billing infrastructure and be able to execute on the clinic. Um, so that's a, it's another great way to, to make sure you're your event still goes on and we can sort of, you know, share resources to make that happen. Great Absolutely. idea. Health department might oh, call oh, Charlie. That's yeah. The... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so let me know, email me. I'm gonna put my email in the chat, email me. I'm happy to connect you to Walgreens through Charlie <laughs> and we can make this happen. <laughs> Thank you. All right. 
next question is there any coverage or plans for people who are on who are insured through medicare without part d for example people with medicare without with medicare without part d cannot receive tdap and hepatitis b unless they pay out of pocket and because they and because they, these people are insured they don't qualify for uninsured vaccine coverage so the base plan that everybody has should include b and so flu, hepatitis B, and, and Tdap, no, flu and hepatitis B would be in there, but you're right, not Tdap. And so that is the problem. Only about 70% of Medicare beneficiaries have a D plan. And so you have a bunch of people who right now do not have coverage for that other set of vaccines. I think that's why you're seeing this strong encouragement for people to actually do Medicare Advantage plans, which is C technically, um, where they have all of that in one place, right? It's kind of like Medicare Managed Care, right? Where they have hospital, doctor's office, and drug uh, and pharmacy benefit all in one program. Um, and there, everything would be covered. But you're true. There is a subset of Medicare beneficiaries that only are going to have coverage if they only have A and B. They're only going to have a coverage for that smaller subset of vaccines that sit inside Part B. And it, really, it's about finding, hopefully, hopefully, they can find the right plan that they can afford either a Medicare Advantage plan, which has all that all the things in it, or adding a Part D plan. And I know that's, that's not the best answer, but unfortunately, we have not been successful at just saying in Part B, all CDC recommended vaccines. That's the best solution because then everything would be covered in the base Medicare program. Again, that's part of our North Star that Charlie was talking about. Then every doctor, every pharmacist could do everything the CDC recommends. So we're headed that way, but until then, patients have to choose which of the plans they can afford for them. Thank you, I'll, I'll echo that, that policy direction, number one. Uh, <laughs> but number two, and we, I don't know this for sure, but I think where we feel like the vaccine for adults program will go to is that in a, in a scenario like that, you may consider that person underinsured. They yes. technically have insurance, but because there is not coverage for the vaccine or there is some sort of cost associated with the vaccine, that individual would be considered un, underinsured and therefore could qualify for, for a coverage program. So I can't say that for sure that that is how the vaccine for adults program is going to work. I will say that the bridge access program for COVID will work that way. So mm -hmm. if that's an indication of where we are moving toward, I think that's a good sign. I think that would be the goal there. The other thing I would just know, and it's it's very small, so I, you know, I hesitate to say this is an option for everywhere, but there are state programs that are purchasing adult vaccine right now um, through public health departments and using those um, immunization program funds. So it's not everywhere and it's not wide scale, which is why, again, we need an uninsured adults program. However, that is an option in some places where they are kind of testing out and they are doing some adult purchase as well. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, Latresa asks, how can you become a partner? So Abby, when you spoke, you talked about wanting more partners for this work. We also spoke about our beautiful pro partners program. So I'm going to answer that and say, if you're interested in becoming a partner, I just put my um, email in the chat. Please let's talk offline and I can connect you to Abby, to Walgreens, or you can probably become a partner through uh, NMQF's SHC uh, community programs. Thank you. Um, next question. Glad somebody Please. asked. That's a, that's a win. I know. I know. <laughs> next question. Can you speak a bit more on how pharmacies provide education to patients to convert vaccines to vaccinations when they've come into a retail store? I think, Charlie, this is for you. Yeah, it's. I love this question. Um, I practiced for a little bit over 10 years, and every day was a treat. I couldn't wait for people to come in and ask questions. I had my job of dispensing medications, but I couldn't wait for people to come and just ask me about their health. Um, because a lot of times, let's you know, even step away from vaccines, I may be the first provider that they have ever seen or have seen in a long time. Uh, I, I mentioned the stat of how many people live so close to a pharmacy and they may not have access to another provider, so we're it. 
Um, and so it is, it is a, um, uh, you know, a privilege to be able to do that. Uh, I think in so many cases, we've uh, really activated people around their health and, and, and kind of referred them to sort of the next step so that they can start addressing any uh, health concerns. But I think with vaccines, I, you know, I, I said it a little bit before is that, you know, don't make assumptions and don't have affirmations around like, okay, they're in, go ahead, sit down and I'm gonna give you a shot. No, each experience, is unique. Um, each person's background is unique and what they feel about vaccines and, and what they've been hearing and, and what their family members or any other value system informs them about that. It's important to address that and have that conversation. I think one of the simplest things that we do is that our pharmacist will proactively speak to a patient to say, hey, this new vaccine came out that's going to uh, be able to protect against this disease. Would you like to learn more about it? Uh, I think asking them and sort of asking their permission to, to, to want to talk about it is a great way to start. Uh, and then it's really about educating. Pharmacists are very expert in, in um, both the pharmacology around vaccines and then the whole administration aspect. Um, so I, I do think that there's a, a great conversation to be had there. Uh, and we have seen so many, well, I'll call it converts. They came in uh, not expecting at all to, to get a vaccine. Um, but after learning about it from a pharmacist, they were ready to sign up and have their family members come along too. Thank you, Charlie. Um, like people question. seem to have really good questions when it comes to yes. vaccination. And so just having that space to have that conversation is, is so essential to this process. Thanks, Abby. All right, I was just trying to be mindful of the time because we are almost all the way to the hour. We have a quick few questions. Um, next question, Abby. I think both you and Phyllis spoke a little bit to this, but I'm just going to ask it anyway. It says, as a free clinic, unable to stock and deliver vaccines, one of the best ways to get our patients connected to necessary. What are the best ways to get our patients connected to necessary vaccines? Currently, we send them to a pharmacy with a good RX discount and try to offset the cost with gift cards. Yeah. So hopefully now. You can just send them and they don't need the good <laughs> or they, I mean, give them the gift card. I, I would say offer the gift card for them agreeing after the wonderful interaction with someone that they want to get vaccinated. <laughs> so so I, I'm, I'm a big fan. I, it's funny the power of the gift card in terms of incentivizing people to go take the time to go to the Walgreens and have the vaccine because they can spend the gift card in the Walgreens when they go there, buy their M&Ms and get their shots. Um, and, and that's really important. So I think that I always pick M&Ms as my pharmacy thing. Um, so I think that the idea is to actually make it easy for the patient to take the next step after you have that extremely important conversation with them. Sorry, you're their learned intermediary. You're the person they trust to give them this advice. You've done that and you say, we don't give vaccines here, but we think it's super important for you to do it. The, all these pharmacies now can offer you the vaccine. Which one's closest to you? This is the one I send your scripts to. Obviously you go there, go there, <laughs> and they will be able to give you these things. And the patient shouldn't actually always need a script. It kind of depends on the state and what vaccine you're talking about. But yeah. oftentimes they can go in there. And, and the good thing is the pharmacy knows which which where they're covered and can help them to get that vaccine. And the patient should experience no out-of-pocket cost in all the different myriad programs we've talked about, including the COVID updated booster when the updated vaccine, when the bridge program starts. Yeah, and Thanks, the, Phyllis. the other thing I would just add to that too, is if you're um, a community health center clinic is talking to your local public health department, because they may also be running free clinics or have special setup days likely not as huge as those original COVID rollouts, but you know they do have for flu season or for other opportunities, um, they will be setting those up. So just having that relationship with your local public health department as well and knowing what they have planned so that maybe you can then also have that as an additional opportunity. That's gonna be particularly Great. true for flu and COVID together. Great, thank you. Now, someone says, what's going to happen to, with 317 now that there are limited 317 funds? So that is a wonderful question. Um, so the immunization program dollars we fight for every year, um, they have been pretty level funded over the last decade. And then we had a huge bump, not in 317 immunization program dollars specifically, but in dollars that went towards 
the COVID pandemic and that vaccination campaign, those dollars we're now coming down from. And so what we really need to do as a community is really try to support um, additional funds, because I think the work is more than ever. Um, the work has grown, the dollars have not. And so that looks towards the congressional appropriations process, um, which we have been following very closely and advocating for, and we will continue to do so. But we're um, at ABAC, at least we're huge um, proponents of supporting funding for that immunization program and make sure that they can get as much as they can to, to do the work that they need to do, because that infrastructure is so important on, on all these fronts. Great, thank you. Next question is very important. It says our local health department is located in a rural area with less than 6,500 people. Many people have to go out of county and out of state for medical care. A number of pharmacies that are used by county residents are closed on weekends. Therefore, a number of older residents and who depend upon employed family members and friends for transportation on weekends will not, be, will not have access to pharmacies as their provisions for, I'm guessing, people like this. Um, I'm not sure who this is, but I just, this sounds like a beautiful place for partnerships to be developed. And I would love to speak with you offline. So if you could use my email to reach out, if you reach out to me in my email, let's look, let's think of something we can do um, for those older people, because it sounds like there are not a lot of partnerships happening there, and we would love to work with you. Yeah, it Next could be question, a partner there, like Uber or somebody else would help drive yeah. people there during the workday. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Are there provisions in place in a place for local departments to have access to vaccines to continue mass vaccination clinics as our LHD has done in the past, as our local oh. health department has done in the past? So, go ahead, John. No, I was going to say it, uh, HHS has indicated, and again, part of the, the bridge program um, is to continue to work with local health departments and the uh, sort of HRSA sponsored sites, so your federally qualified health centers, your rural health clinics, community health clinics, um, to provide them with vaccine. Uh, so I, I, I would uh, recommend to speak to sort of regional HHS and CDC folks um, that can get set up with programs like that. And then, of course, if there are needs beyond that, um, utilizing the, the pharmacy channel or directing patients to. I remember the, right now that's a COVID, that's a updated vaccines for COVID solution. Um, and, and I think, but I think Abby's right. Many of the local health departments are planning for this respiratory season to have clinic days there where they might give flu, COVID, and maybe RSV, or at least flu and COVID. So a lot of these opportunities to give people COVID vaccine are going to be used to at least try to get people up to date on some others and maybe have discussions mm -hmm. about where they can go to get the others they need. Absolutely. Thank you. And finally, it's a, there's a final question here that says, is this a current updated change or is there a future date for uninsured vaccines? So we covered two things. The bridge program for COVID is actually coming soon, right? That, that is actually almost done when we have the updated vaccines approved by the FDA, recommended by the CDC, the bridge program for COVID vaccines will go into effect. Abby's discussion about the broader vaccines for adults program for the uninsured is right now just a policy proposal. It needs to get through Congress. And so, you know, we are committed as a vaccine stakeholder community and policy leaders to trying to get that done. We need everybody's help to get that done. <laughs> and, and that is a much bigger program, but it could have a huge impact on the health of millions of uninsured Americans. American adults, um, if we can get that over the finish line. So one is a, just a proposal and an idea and a legislative idea that we need to accomplish, but the bridge program for COVID vaccines is real and we'll start when the vaccines arrive. And just to say the other two out loud, the Medicare Part D changes went into effect last January and the Medicaid provisions for all vaccines will go into effect this October. So um, we've got a couple things happening and a couple things that we'll be working towards. Actually, if you pull up the last, there was one slide after the question slide that's kind of a little bit of a summary. It doesn't have those dates in it, but it actually, um, it does sort of capture where people should, which programs people should be able to have vaccines at no cost to them. And then this last block is this uninsured program that's a proposal. So there's one slide after our question slide that acts as a summary. You can take a look at and um and, and certainly everyone will have these slides to understand the timing of the different things, but 
that last slide can help people quickly look and see where there's coverage and where there's not yet coverage. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Charlie. Any last words before we? Okay. okay. All right. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say thank you and, and loved being on the panel with my, my colleagues here and stressing how important it is. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you so much, Abby, Phyllis, and Charlie, for having this great discussion with our folks. I know we had a lot of people online, and I can't wait to share this with so many more people who were not able to join us today. And I'm looking forward to having more people be able to have access to these vaccines. And um, if there are any questions, I know that you'll be willing to work with me to send them back to be able to answer them for our participants. And I'm so thankful again for that as well. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.